So today's verse is First Canto, Chapter Two, Text Number Eight, out of eighteen thousand verses. We're picking this one today. Okay. Dharma Svanusti Tachungsan. Dharma Svanusti Tapung Sang Vishvaka Ukshena Katha Suyoho No Pada Yadiratim Shama Eva He Kavalam Somebody else chant. Dharma Swanusti Tapum Sun. This vaccine Katasuya. No Padaya Yavira Pim. Shana Eva Yukeva. Dharma Ladies, Dharma Sanustita Pum Sam Vishwasayam Pitan Sunyam No Padayam Yadivratim Shrama Eva Nikai Vavam Oh, 
So this is a very, very big book, <laughs> notice. And uh, this is the actual, what do you call it, the, the, the verses with the purports, this much. You can look here, see, that's big. Okay. But the, the back part's not small either. <laughs> it's a really big index. You know? Take advantage of it. Uh, and then there's a nice section about the author, the biography of Holocaust, nice to learn. And of course, there are also many volume biographies also. Then there's a thing, is there's a glossary, which I, I think is useless. <laughs> okay. Then there's a Sanskrit pronunciation guide. So has the, has the original Devanagri characters and how each one is produced, you know. Okay, so having studied psychology, I can tell you, uh, human beings have a tremendous number of nerves in the fingers and the mouth. You know? Chimpanzees have a lot in the fingers, but not the mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when you're pronouncing these things precisely the way they're written, it stimulates this whole apparatus you know, very precisely, and that it goes over the whole body. If you're traveling or something and you can't wash anything else, wash your mouth. And right away, you'll feel so many nerves. You know? So understanding, uh, the, it's very, very scientific. I haven't got time to do it now, but it's a very, very systematic you know, process, you know, uh, the language. And, and so the pronunciation, the rhythm, the meters, these things, you see, so purifying for your body, your consciousness. You know? So it's a whole depth study. There's like maybe six different levels on a Sanskrit here we could discuss. But anyway, this is more the content, okay? So each word, dharma, ha, occupation, svanustita, executed in terms of one's own position, fungsam, of humankind, okay, vishva, kshena, the personality of the Godhead, plenary portion. It's like the, the, the ambassador from France, when he comes to the United States, he's plenary potentate, plenary potentate for the, the government of, of France. Yeah. And wherever the embassy is, it's not a part of, a part of the United States. The United States, people can, cannot enter in there. There's no... No military or anything else intervention can go where the embassy of France is established. So it's very similar. So Vishvakshena means is a, we're talking about a plenary plenary portion <laughs> of God. Okay. Katasu. In the message of yeah, yeah. what is nah, not upadaya. Does produce yadi if 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 ratim attraction trauma useless labor eva only he certainly cable on entirely so this was. It's condemning something as useless, certainly, only, entirely. Translation, okay. Dharma is svanustita pum sam vishvaksena kata shriya no padayen yadivatim shramai vahi kevalam. The occupational activities a man performs according to his own position, according to his own position, yeah. are only so much useless labor if they do not provoke attraction for the message of the personality of God. Yes. He appeared. The occupational activities a man performs according to his own position 
are only so much useless labor. If they do not provoke attraction for the message of the personality of God, Godhead. So, of course, this is coming in a whole context. We've been studying it, reading it now several days. Um, the whole Vedic culture is there. It's enormous. It's vast. The British, maybe tried to minimize it or didn't appreciate it, but it's, it's extended in so many forms. You know? Then out of all this literature, everything else, there's the Bhagavad Purana, you know, which is, tonight we're going to do one of the simply wonderful, simply wonderful writing. Last time we did it, we did an overview of the Bhagavatam as world classical literature, and then the Bhagavatam is part of the whole Vedic literature of uh, Prabhupada's library. So tonight we're going to go through just an overview of the Bhagavatam because it's extremely well organized. Um, I think I have timing here. Yeah. Yeah. So if you missed our class on last time, tough look. <laughs> okay. The, the catalog is Catalogorum, list, lists over. 140,000 known cataloged ancient Sanskrit texts. There are many more. Okay. And they cover so many different subject matters. There's 17 other Puranas. And most of the Puranas don't even have commentaries, major commentaries. And they start off talking about gym therapy and they go to talking about something else. We can't figure out what they're talking about exactly. But, but their content is there. The Bhagavatam is so systematic, so organized, so focused in what it's doing. So tonight maybe we can talk about that. It's just a you know, very, very clear book of what he's trying to accomplish. So in the first, first, uh, first chapter, here we are. And the sages are asking questions. They're very qualified people. And they're asking Sutta Goswami, and his qualifications are given. So it's a very good chance to hear something from very, you know, intelligent people about what do they ask? You know, what is what 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 is what is every what is the occupation people should adopt? You know? Everybody has their occupation in life. You go to college to get some occupation. So many things. You know? you know? But they're saying, what is Svai Pumsam Paro Dharma? What is, what is for all Pumsam, all human beings, what is the, the greatest Dharma, foremost Dharma? What is the Dharma of sugar? Huh? What is the Dharma of fire? What is the Dharma of human beings? Huh? <laughs> yeah, but that's their question. What is, so by, what is the ultimate dharma of all people? What makes people tick? Make makes them work. You know? So that's the first question he's answering. The other question is too: What is the significance of all the different avatars? There's so many books. What's the best book? Specifically, what is the significance of Krishna's avatar? And so they ask several questions. But right off, he's taking this one first about what is what is the essence of all dharma. And kind of got to understand that in the Vedas, this is a topic which is discussed again and again in the Mahabharata, Dharma, Dharma. Those who protect the Dharma will be protected by Dharma. You know, it's a kind of a hard word to, to exactly translate in our, in our, our culture and stuff. Baba translates it as religious duties, but more like, uh, but also might come across as so, so civic duties. Everybody has their civic duty in society and responsibility. You know? Yeah, yeah. So uh, yesterday, was a great one here, it says, by, by rendering devotional service unto the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, one immediately acquires, you know, jnana and vairagya, wisdom and renunciation. Yeah. And before that was the very principal one, Svai Pum Sam Parodharmo, number six, that the supreme occupation duty and occupational duty for all humanity is that by which Right? He's not saying it is. He's saying that supreme occupation of duty is that by which you can actually come to pure devotional service. Uninterrupted and no selfish motive. Okay. And if you do that, then automatically these things that everybody wants, being a pious person, being cool, being nice, being wise, being renounced, which will make you happy, it comes automatically. Okay. Then the contrast. So many times in, in the, the, all of our literature you'll find the contrast. Back and forth, back and forth, looking at how, to, how it teaches. Okay. And here it's talking then about those people whose occupational duties, you know, you're taking them up, you know. Um, one devotee, uh, Parthasarthi, the Parthasarthi Das? Parthasarthi Das. Yeah, he's a famous guy. He was, he was, he was in the war in uh, Iraq, like that. We, we were real, 
real soldier <laughs> in real real life. He was like like a some kind of master sergeant or something. He had about about a hundred and he said that had a hundred and thirty eight you know swars other sergeants, corporals and soldiers under his authority. You know, and it, you know, he said he didn't he didn't know how many people he had killed. You know, and he didn't know how any, but he knew that he knew that they almost got him six times. <laughs> I mean, he just you know came almost dying six times and stuff. So I guess it was a fair you know, fair thing. He made it through somehow. Or but is it? But it, he confirmed it. There's a very, very famous phrase: "There are no atheists in foxholes." Right? In Spanish, ¿Cómo se dice? There are no atheists in foxholes. No, no. No hay ateos in trincheros. No hay ateos in trincheros. Yeah, yeah. When you're 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 landing on the beach in Iwo Jima, the front of your little craft comes down. And the Japanese people are shooting bullets at you made of solid steel, you know, steel covered lead this big, and it's coming at you at 650 miles an hour. It goes through the people, yeah. And out of 25 people that landing, the first 18 are dead within the first 50 seconds. And you're lying. There. That's a true story. You're lying there in a little crater with your face down on the thing. You were born into a Mormon family, and then for the first time in your life, you pray sincerely. <laughs> <laughs> this is a true story. One guy describing what happened to him. He was praying and stuff, but this, you know, this is, are you there? Are you really there? His bullets are going around. Death is just, you know, whizzing past you at every moment. Just, not, you know, knock your face off. Yeah. Somehow, you know, I'm here. <laughs> he had a very, very you know, interesting life and stuff like that. Okay. So his occupational duty was, was inspiring, you know, and interesting Krishna Kata. Okay. Yeah. So maybe maybe we can do something. What will be so? Maybe God can get our attention without being so extreme. You know Robin Williams, the movie uh, "What Dreams May Come," pretty famous movie. "What Dreams May Come" with Robin Williams and stuff. Anyway, he dies and goes someplace. His wife dies first, and first his kid dies, and his kids die. He's a doctor. His kids die, and then his wife commits suicide, and he dies. Okay. And you kind of wake up. He's disoriented. And he's someplace, and there's some kind of kind of black guy there saying, "Hello, hello, <laughs> hello, hello, I'm here. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm your guy, and you die. You know, you're in heaven now. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. He's showing him how you can, you know, walk underwater <laughs> and do stuff. You know. And then Robert Williams asks, he says, he said, well, well, where's God in all of this? You know? And he says, oh, he's up there, trying to tell us that he loves us, and wondering, trying, and, and, and wondering, wondering why we can't listen." So Robert Williams goes, oh yeah, okay, now where's my family? <laughs> says, yeah. Yeah. So so many of the Puranas are giving the message, but people they, you know they, people don't want to listen. So they attract them by different things. Pray to God you get this. Pray to God you get that. You have a long life with your husband. Your husband will live a long time. In time and you have many nice children. You'll, you'll conquer your enemies and be successful. Okay, but different Puranas are there. So all this dharma that we're taking up is saying occupational activities a man performs according to his own position are only so much useless labor if they do not provoke attraction to the message of the personality of God. This goes right into ISKCON, now our Hare Krishna movement, any, any church, but right here. Guru Kripa Swami, very famous ISKCON sannyasi, he said that Prabhupada told him one time, if you, if you work hard all day, you know, and, and don't remember Krishna, you know, the, your day was a complete waste of time. <laughs> in, in devotional service, you can you can schedule yourself right out of Krishna consciousness and stuff, and doing so many things. And you know, yeah, you can probably see it. I mean, I mean I, after six years, I, six years of being a devotee, I saw it. I just kind of really like my whole focus on what I was doing had changed away from why I came, why I got involved. I was just becoming institutionalized. And you get, wear nice clothes, <laughs> have a nice place to sleep. So one devotee said, three, three hots in a cot. <laughs> That's what I'm after. Three hots in a cot. Three hot meals a day in a cot. <laughs> Whatever you, I don't care. You know? yeah. So then I took time off, you know, and just went to Brindos and I was in Brindab and I was really focused on getting my, my consciousness back fixed. The consciousness, the bhava. Yeah. And then your mind will follow that. So. Okay, so if I was purport, there are different occupational activities in terms of one's 
different uh, conceptions of life. Okay? To the gross materialist who cannot see anything beyond the gross material body, there is nothing beyond the senses. Therefore, his occupational activities are limited to concentrated and extended selfishness. Okay. Concentrated selfishness centers around the, what, the, the, the personal body. This is generally seen amongst lower animals. Extended selfishness is manifest in human society. And of course, even wolves, even wolves have, right? They have some kind of extended, extended society. And centers around the family, society, community, nation, and world, with a view to gross bodily comfort. Okay. Above these gross materialists are the mental speculators who hover aloft in the mental sphere, and their occupational duties involve making poetry and philosophy and movies, okay. or propagating some ism with the same aim of selfishness limited to the body and the mind. And the mind. Uh, there, um, there was a uh, a conference at some university on the East Coast. Uh, it was called the Nobel Conference on Aesthetics. And they would invite different Nobel laureates to come and talk about beauty within science. And it was quite amazing. You know, the things they give. These big people were talking about their their feelings and how they were motivated and so on. One Chinese Nobel laureate. He was talking about the almost inconceivable pleasures of the mind. <laughs> yeah, it's just like we gross people may get something gross, but these mental, mental speculators and stuff, you start being, you know, six-dimensional chests and things like this. The kind of, you know, mathematicians, the kind of things they get into, what's the name? I forget they're called now. Something numbers, different Fibonacci numbers or something. Oh, you know, you can, you can, you know, those beautiful pictures, you can, you can create, you know, one billion in one square foot of space like that. It's just, yeah. Okay. But above the body and mind is the dormant spirit soul. Dormant. Dormant. Whose absence from the body makes the whole range of bodily and mental, mental selfishness completely null and void. But less intelligent people have no information of the needs of the spirit soul. Someone else want to read? The microphone. Okay. Because foolish people have no information of the soul, how is the only purview of the body and mind? They are not satisfied with the performance of their occupation duties. The question of the satisfaction of the soul is raised here. The self is beyond the gross body and so mind. It is the potent, active principle of the body and mind. Without knowing the need of the dormant soul, one cannot be happy simply with emolument of the body and mind. The body and the mind are both superfluous outer covering of the spirit soul. The spirit soul's needs must be fulfilled. Simply by cleansing the cage of the bird, one does not satisfy the bird. One must actually know the need. So we can look at that in terms of our most classical story, the Bhagavad Gita. Right? There's two people, Duryodhana, you know, who wants to win, and Arjuna, who wants to win. Yeah. So what's the problem at the beginning? Arjuna has a, has a problem. Why does Arjuna want to win in the beginning? Who's he fighting for? Huh? His family that they'll be enjoying. Yeah. When the Pandavas, the story, you know the story it happened was a game of dice. You know this story at all? Anybody know this story? Their, their cousins invited them to a friendly game of dice, but everybody knew it wasn't a friendly game of dice. And they cheated and you know, took away everything. You know, and even, even tried to desnude Dropody. And if somebody tried to take, take the clothes off of one of the girls, <laughs> she was screaming. <laughs> you know, Everybody here would like, you know, all the men, <laughs> help. <laughs> but this is terrible. It was just ghastly. 
And she was like a very elevated person, high class lady. It's like trying to designate the uh, first lady of the United States of America or something. And, 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 you know, in the White House, and the White House along with CNN going. That's what it was. It was completely, you know, insane what they were doing. And Bishno was trying to stop them, but he, you know, Krishna restrained him. Let them go. Let them go. It's a very, very subtle interest. Very, very subtle play of Dharma without Krishna. It's so beyond our level of what is right and what is wrong. It's so stimulating about these things like that. So in any case, then Draupadi was, you know, her, her five husbands wouldn't help her. So that when they were walking off to the forest, she opened her hair up. What does that mean? It's interesting. Even like this. In Vedic culture, only a widow doesn't have her hair closed. <laughs> Yeah, this is a cultural thing. Okay. Yeah. Also, you can't show your shoulders in Bengal. <laughs> you can show your navel, but not your shoulders. <laughs> Different cultures. Yeah. So, in any case, she was up doing her hair like that, and Yudhisthira is asking her, why, why are you opening your hair like that? You know? And she says, uh, I'm a widow. What do you mean? You know, I, If I had a real man for a husband, he would have taken care of me. <laughs> this is bad enough for any guy. Right? But these are Shakyas. These are like, this is, you know, so she knows what she's doing. You know? So the, uh, you know, Duryodhana was not afraid of the Pandavas. They're guys. They'll forgive, forgive, and forget. But Draupadi's not going to forget. He's a woman. She's, she's not going to be satisfied until we're dead. You know? So a very, very intense thing about Sri Dharma and everything else. You know? She was the cause of everything. She caused everything else. Who's more powerful, men or women? You know? she, she, she killed 640 million people. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yep. Yeah. Uh, even if she didn't want to. Yeah. So, so, so Arjuna, at the beginning of this battle, when things are there, it's finally after all this time to get a chance to fight, to fight their enemies. And they're so happy. Oh, God, 12 years we've been waiting for this fight. <laughs> Bhima's looking at his wristwatch kind of <laughs> like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the earth is shaking. Okay. So then, but what does he want to do? He, at the end of the whole thing, he wants to take all the crowns of these guys back who insulted Dropa and everybody else and drop them at her feet and say, I've defeated all these people who harassed you. He wants her to see her tie her hair up and say, thank you, Arjuna. <laughs> yeah, he's, it's subtle. It's even righteous. Uh, she, they deserve this. And looking at it, strictly speaking, this. There's almost no way on earth you can criticize them. They've tolerated everything, right? You just steer. But finally, okay, now we get our chance for satisfaction. <laughs> What's sweeter than waiting 12 years you know, for, for revenge? <laughs> yeah. Bhima, and one of the things, rips Dushash in his chest open and he has the blood on his face. Peter Brook movie. Camera comes in close and he says, there is nothing sweeter than the blood of my enemy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So his, he's in Maya. Yeah, you know? he wants to satisfy his wife when his office is sex and be pleased with him. Other things too. So he's, he's motivated by this bodily conception of life and in a very elevated sense, very ethical and moral, but it's still, you know, for us, for, for our family, for our people. You know, how high can you go in this thing and still not get satisfaction? So, on the other hand, Duryodhana is a real gross guy. I mean, he he wants to he wants to win it so he can have people, you know, little, little girls throwing flowers in front of him, other men slapping him on the back, and everything else, and getting you know the best seat in the house and everything else. Very very gross gross bodily concept. But, not, but he was still not all that gross. And he still wanted to think of himself as a good guy. And when the poor came, he extended his hand to them. When the you know. Like that and so on. So the whole whole culture, any anybody there, do you own anybody else? If they were present in the United States, it would be like probably a lot better in many ways. You know? Except that there is some Christian culture here. You know, that was the only thing. Is that Duryodhana was not, you know, he didn't understand the soul. Right. First thing is we're not the body. Confidential knowledge, more confidential. What's more confidential than that? Huh? We're not the body, and in that non-bodily state, we serve the Supreme Spirit. 
And many people are not the body. People know that. Stoics, they stick their hands in burning coals and say, you're going to torture me? <laughs> well, yeah. no. You realize this. But the next thing is, well, what do you do in this non-bodily state? Well, there's the Supreme Spirit. Wow. Yeah. So the satisfaction of the soul. Yeah. And that's what Arjuna is. He's also in the beginning not getting it. He just, he's you know, damned if you do and damned if you don't. If I fight the battle, I lose all my relatives. You know? Krishna, they're rascals. My cousins are demons. There are so many horrible people. But Krishna, they're my cousins. <laughs> End of the, end of the Peter, Brook Mahab uh, Peter Brook Mahabharata. If you see it on YouTube, it's really nice. They have extract. The Mahakrishna Maharaj and Guru saw the whole thing. It's a very big, epic Western performance of the Mahabharata. So in the end, Bhima defeats Duryodhana and he has his head a foot on his neck. And, uh, Yudhisthira comes and he says, Bhima, he's our cousin and he was a king. <laughs> Even Bhima is all right. So it's very deep, you know. And so he's going to lose, if he fights, he's going to lose all his family relationships, right? The subtle aspect we're talking about. Now. If he doesn't fight, he's going to go to the forest. He knows he can't sit there and chant Joppa every day. If he was here right now, he'd be about this big. And all the girls would be going, oh, like that. And all the guys would be going, oh. <laughs> he's handsome, he's intelligent, he's clever. You know, he's just really, he's born to, to live, Kshatriya, right? Happy life and so many things. Okay, guys, we're going to take over the city in three weeks. Are you with me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, you there. What you doing? And he's like, very, he's going to go in the forest and sit down and chant, chant. All right, no, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all and you know, you can't do it. So damned if you do and damned if you don't. So fortunately, unlike Hamlet, he's got Krishna. And then Krishna says, okay, this is how you get out of this mess. You do your duty. You fight these rascals. You win do it for his honor. But you don't do it for her. You do it for me. You do it because she's my devotee. I mean, she might have done this. She even said that. When you're harassing her, that was her final argument. I am a devotee of Sri Krishna. You shouldn't do this. <laughs> so they knew what they were doing. Okay, it's the birdhouse, right? We're we'll back to the birdhouse here. We've got to really know what is the satisfaction of the soul. And then we've got to start ourselves, like, you know, figuring out how we can get, get some of this. We're going to read next, 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 next paragraph. Here. It goes on, I guess better. <laughs> microphone. Get the microphone. Swami write this, you know? Where was he? Huh? Yeah, it was, he was still in India. He heard about the West, you know? Probably was describing to one scientist what it was like when he came here, and he said, everything was bigger. He said, even the squirrels were bigger. <laughs> I 
American squirrels <laughs> bigger. You know. So he just he had he had some knowledge in India, which at that time was probably, I don't know, probably kind of strange, you know, kind of the idea they had of the West. But he's writing, you know, what, for what he thinks is a Western audience. And you see the, the second canto and so on, when he actually came to the West and saw things, you'll see the difference in how he's making the presentation. Radharani is really happy today with, with flowers. <laughs> Looks really good. So, uh, you can see that so many times here, Prabhupada is paraphrasing other things. Once you go on reading like that, like yesterday, Sunday looks and you go back to it again, and you start seeing, wow, this Prabhupada's talking about this, Prabhupada's talking about that. You start to see that Prabhupada's books are not only just continuous, but they're deep. That's what has to happen. They have to become continuously Krishna conscious, then it has to become deep, then it has to become broad. <laughs> and at that point, Krishna is everywhere, and we're reacting to him, and then we can remember who, who we are. I'm a cow. <laughs> I'm a dog. Okay. I'm a blade of grass, but a really good blade of grass. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then it's waking up. I was one time I had, how many people here have had tonsillectomy? Don't be, don't be ashamed. Raise your hand if you've had tonsillectomy. No, you haven't had it. <laughs> Just the two of us. Okay, been there. <laughs> Yeah, and now you take care of this stuff. When, when surgery came in, it, 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 the drop of a hat, you do surgery. It was like, <laughs> it was the most new thing. So anyway, I had my tonsils out. And I was lying in the, on the, the gurney, you know, this rolling bed there, strapped on it, strapped on. And uh, it was in the recovery room, maybe like about six, seven more people lying there on these beds and, and different states of coming out of the, uh, you know, the intoxication, the anesthesia. And one lady was over there, a nurse, and she was like kind of looking through her women, women's magazine, fashion magazine, and keeping an eye on people, you know. And um, after some time, I started like, you know, kind of trying to claw, claw the, the mucus and blood out of my mouth. And she came over and wiped my hand off with this fixed, fixed thing. She said, the operation is over. You're in the recovery room. And I said, <laughs> Okay, so it's happened about three times, and every single time she had the same mantra, same mantra she was giving me, you know. But I was becoming more and more conscious. So funny, I was kind of, my, my brains were kind of like putting together where I was a little bit, but I kind of like, you know, look, looked around and confirmed it and stuff, you know. And at a certain point, I knew where I was and everything else. And, so, you know? and then she, other people were completely knocked out. Other people, she was going over and telling the mantra, and some were going out before me. You know? So I've come here to tell you, the operation is over. You're in the recovery room. <laughs> then we're going, yeah, yeah. But most of us is just, well, maybe. Yeah. I think I'm on the right path. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I mean, you can be all the way to basically first initiation, even second initiation, and all you come to is honesty is I really think I'm on the right path. You know, you know, even if even if I it's not true, it's better that better to avoid smoking and drinking and you know and fornicating and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, it's, it doesn't matter. This is good. You know, and I, I have and maybe Brahmande Brahmatikom Bhagavan Ji Krishna gives us these experiences. I mean, how many people here have had mystical experiences in their life? Okay, okay, <laughs> it's like something happened. You think about it. Yeah. I interviewed devotees one time with Brahmacharya, maybe 21, there's 23 people, how they became devotees. In like 19 out of 23 cases, there was a mystical experience. You know, myself too. And it's okay, in the beginning, Jesus Christ said, unless you see miracles, you won't believe. But yeah, you're getting a free taste. You, know? you get a free, free all expense paid vacation in Hawaii. In the middle of, you're in Chicago in the wintertime, <laughs> you win this thing with your family, you go to Hawaii. In, in Hawaii, the pigs eat mangoes. <laughs> like I'm not joking. It's like mangoes falling from the street. There was no mosquitoes. It's never cold. I mean, it's just like a different world. You know, just swimming. <laughs> you know, yeah. So then you say, "Wow, this is where I want to live." Okay, I'm sorry. Your two weeks are up. Back to Chicago. <gasps> okay, but now you have got some experience. You know, there are places that are nice. Right? I know it. You know? Okay, but then you got to, you know, get your change your job, you got to do this. So there's different levels you got to go through. 
But if we got the experience, the beach of the seed in the beginning, then it's a whole difference in terms of like Walt Whitman talking about yesterday. I don't know where I don't know where it goes, but it goes someplace good. Okay, that's motivating. But if you actually have had experience of it, one devotee, Paul Ignosa, uh, he told me he was in New York when the movement was starting. And he was a cool guy and he was, you know, participating in the theater scene in New York and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, and so one time he was walking down the street, he told me, and he heard this, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Okay. And so around the corner came this minute, boys and girls in bed sheets, you know, hopping up and down with, you know, with their tennis shoes on with no socks. And, you know, like that, yeah. And in the front of him was walking this older, kind of old, older, older Indian guy with his cane was walking in front of him, looked more respectable. He said, oh, that's the Hare Krishnas, and that's their guru, you know, Swami, Swami so-and-so, you know. And he said the Prabhupada came up to him, and the Prabhupada looked at him, and he looked back at Prabhupada, the Prabhupada looked at him, and that was it. That was the seed that guided him for the next 20, 20 years of his life. He finally got an issue after 20 years, so slow. You know? <laughs> but he was always with devotees and everything else. He said when, when Prabhupada looked at him, yeah, he could, he could see this guy is not a fool. He's not out to get something from him. You just you can see this person's like, and, he, and Prabhupada was looking at him. So he just kind of like relaxed and opened up. So Prabhupada looked at him and Prabhupada went like, like this, you know, which meant, he said what, what it was is, you're not happy. You should join us. And he responded. <laughs> which, which meant, you know, very clearly, um, it's, it's, it's true, but I still have a few more options. Okay, and then Prabhupada responded, <laughs> basically, and that was very clear, you know. Okay, but if it doesn't work out, we're here. Like that. So that's the bija. You can have a lot of these. Did we read the book or something? You know, something happens, you know. You've got to cultivate those, protect them, you know, by, by getting the right kind of occupation. This is very, very practical. You know, there, there are occupations for men, for women, for adults, for children, for every kind of person like that. And you find out, you know, what is your particular nature and by, by being a devotee. Of course, in a good culture, you're pretty clear by the, you know, if you go to college to give you tests, right? Which can really help, you know, yeah, yeah. But, but a more mature culture, you're learning these things. You're learning these things as you grow up and everything else. And you're finding how, how to do it. Our culture, boy, there's almost no training in social life whatsoever. Yeah. I mean, how much training is there in terms of marriage in, I mean, in our public education system? Yeah, I think that, that I think the Methodists have this 50 question essay you can take online, and you know, so, so before before matrimony, and after that, I think it's like 70 percent of the people who are thinking about getting married decide not to get married. <laughs> yeah. Do you like traveling? I hate it. <laughs> you know, how many kids you want? 15. How many you want? Zero. I mean, it's just like the most simple, basic things, you know, about people, and they see that. Hey, we're just like. Totally different. Okay, we'll be friends. And I'll try and find some guys maybe I want to get married to. I'll find some, pick up some girls. From, yeah, okay, now we're going to, but hey, with a simple questionnaire, so many people realize hey, this is stupid. We're not going to you know, be happy together. Yeah. yeah. So this is, this is Varna Ashram. It's a very big part of the Bhagavatam. The whole Bhagavatam, basically, you can just take it and condense it down to nectar of devotion, like this thick, rather than this thick. And that's the, you know, you can follow the, the red line in the museum or the yellow line or the green line. Okay. You know, the red line you go through, you know, for 10 minutes, the blue line, okay. So the Bhagavatam has so much about Daivi Varna Ashram Dharma. Using all these occupations and roles and stuff like that, what is, you know, for, for, for spiritual purpose. And you see so many stories. I can put these stories in modern language and do it and it freaks people out. It's just like, Happened, it really happened. I mean, for example, did you hear what happened last Saturday in Italy? You didn't hear about it. Wow, it's a very big temple there, and it's very famous, big marble temple built like that, you know. And so it's a big Sunday feast. They have a big Sunday feast program. We saw a lot of people coming and stuff and stuff like that. So the temple president that came in, and he was a very, very big book distributor. He's got like that, you know, two cell phones like that. So everybody's oh, Jaya Jaya Prabhu. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then there was one guy there who was actually doing the Food for Life program, which was not very, you know, prestigious because you go out getting food to bums and stuff. And he was over by the altar chanting his rounds because, he, you know, nobody really helping him. So he had some few rounds left and he just hadn't really changed his clothes. So his temple president already had some 
some friction with the guy. So he came in and started right in front of everybody. Just, you know, it was really ugly. Stopped the whole thing and started chastising in front of everybody. But this complication was the temple president's daughter was married to this guy, who's a Guru Kuli. So she started defending her father and said, people like you do book distribution just to fill up your bellies and stuff. It was got really intense. And she ran out crying and she came back and covered with water, but it wasn't water, it was gasoline. She set herself on fire. This is the story of Daksha. <laughs> in the Bhagavatam had modernized it. But he said, Sati, okay, who's, who's this proof of life guy? Lord Shiva, okay, yeah. Who, who's the temple president? Daksha, okay, yeah. Now, I've got to say, this did not happen. It did not happen. It did not happen. I'm not so many told you about <laughs> It did not happen. This is, but this is a story. You put it in the and it's, and it's like something, wow, this, you know, it's, it's, these things are happening in this gone. Yeah. We're, once you come to this society, you're dealing with a level, you're starting to deal with gods and goddesses. You're dealing with people, very subtle problems, processes and stuff. You go outside around and you tell everybody, hey, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll give you a million bucks. What I got to do? You got to promise to become celibate for the rest of your life. <laughs> That's the whole purpose of the money. And you come around, walk around here and say, I'll give you a million bucks to break the four principles. 100,000? I got it. I got $100,000. <laughs> you see, it's just. You're in, a, you're in a whole different community here with different purposes and stuff. And there's a lot of people in between. There's Jehovah's Witnesses, there's Mormons, and, you know, Greenpeace, you know, what's it called? Peta. <laughs> yeah. But so it's a very, very intense book. It's going to go through all these different kinds of people and all the kind of people you're going to meet, and pagans and everybody else. And you take it to heart. Hey, it takes, what, four years to get a bachelor's degree in psychology. What are you talking about this? Okay. But yeah, from the very beginning, you begin to pick up stuff. So right here is this first thing that whatever you're doing, even as a devotee, occupational things, if you're naturally a pujari or you're outside and meeting people and you want to look for conflict with people, you know, whatever it is, you know, unless it's actually, unless at the end of the day, it's not increasing your desire to get back and do the Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita and stuff, you know, see, it's, it's not, not, not correct. Maybe it's giving you liberation. That's good. You know, but it's not like, Inspiring, you come back and you want to hear all his books and stuff. So, any comments or questions about this? Anybody want to know what happened to Bhakta? What was his name? <laughs> Paul. Paul Inosa. Yeah. Yeah. Over there. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Your discourse is always. Educational and entertaining. Okay. Most people like me know so much of ignorance. You know, the uh, aspect of uh, the dormant spiritual soul. Ah, yeah. There's so many points in here. You know, yeah, that, yeah. that aspect of uh, being dormant, it's about the mind of intelligence. And less intelligence don't realize it. It's the revival of our spiritual consciousness. Bring intelligence and understanding of it's there. And the, the dormancy is, is becomes neutral at that point. It becomes an activity. Yeah. You mentioned the leisure, the seed of bhakti. Now, at that point, is it is it revived? Is it planted? Is it is it already there, or is it placed in by association with the body, the guru, the sastra? Wow. Okay. There's a there's a box in Greek mythology. If one person bought this box and the name was Pandora. <laughs> the origin of the Jiva. <laughs> Big controversy. Um, because some people are saying that you know, we, we were never with Krishna, you know, like that and stuff. And it's a whole complicated thing about our, our, our spiritual nature was there, but it was dormant. It was never manifest. And then we came into the material world. And then it, then it becomes awakened for the first time. This is a whole, I don't want to develop 1980s or something. And the Bhaisheshik was saying it's true. It became such a hot topic because you know, one, one prominent guru was saying, you know, we, we, ne we never fell from Vaikuntha. And the Prabhupada's general thing is back home, back to Godhead, which is you know, pretty much if you were there and just coming back. And so, so, I mean, looking at it, reading Prabhupada's books, well, one, one, one letter 
Uh, somebody is saying, well, in the beginning, we were just kind of in the Brahma Jyoti, we were Sayuja Mukti, like that, you know. And other person said, no, we were Sarupya, we were with Krishna and everything else, you know. And so Prabhupada said, whether you were Sayuja Mukti, Mukti or Swarupya Mukti, now you are neither one. <laughs> so, and that's <clears throat> even the, they quote Jaiva Dharma by Bhakti Notako, which Prabhupada never made comments on, but it's a nice book, very good book, not a very specific thing. Um, and even there, looking at it, he, he's, he's, it's dialogues. Even though the sages, when they're talking about it, they say the same thing, you know, that, that you know, right now, it's, it's ridiculous to even talk about it. So you don't even know what mukti means or relationship means. So right now, it's the same here. My topic for today is do your duty, do your dharma. Buddha never talked about the non-existence of the soul. They came to Buddha and they said, Buddha, because he was a big controversial guy, you know. So some people said there was a soul, some people said there wasn't a soul, some people said there was a God, some people said there was a God. And they came one time in the big crowd and stuck the gun in Buddha's face and said, what do you say, Buddha? Is there a soul or not? And the Buddha said, Buddha says, you should find out. <laughs> yeah. So that's Buddha. Buddhism in its real sense is Upadharma. It's that which takes us to Dharma. You know, Buddha is pointing out the importance of self-realization and the process for doing it, but not getting much of the conclusion at all. Socrates said the same thing, right? The unexamined life is not worth living. So that's the topic I'm supposed to be discussing today on the first. Just remember. Yeah. So different people are on on different levels, but as far as looking at Prabhupada's book, basically it's saying that, yeah, I mean, one time he says, we, we were with Krishna, but somehow or other we did not like, we did not like to serve Krishna. So it is, you know, it, it's a whole big discussion. But basically, yeah, as far as understanding your public book, we could be in Vaikuntha, we're in Goloka somehow or other, and you can fall down from Goloka, you can leave Goloka and go to Vaikuntha. It's, it's like a fall down and decide, well, I want to go back or something. You know, it's flexible. But once you get in the material world, then of course the, your soul, the self, the Atma, is very compressed, covered over. It's here. It's like a child on the lap of his father trying to drive the car. <laughs> you know, I want to go there. I want to go there. He's, he can't even move the steering wheel. He can't touch the pedals, but the father understands. And they're playing. And, you know, lets him drive the car and stuff. So we're desiring things in a very, very, sometimes we're a little bit awake. It depends on Sudhasattva, you know, up to Brahmaloka, we're quite awake. We can see who we are, what we're doing, but we're still inside the body. And then we're still not safe. So different levels in animal life and bacterial life, we're very covered. This, but the, the basic principle of desire is still there. Bacteria. Prabhupada says you put your finger on an ant, it'll struggle to live. Yeah? Yeah. It's that basic desire is there. But as you go more elevated, it becomes you start to see I'm a person, this and that, and you know, this, you know death chetrias, right? Motor passion, death before dishonor. <laughs> Kill them all like God sort of. <laughs> yeah, these, you know, very brave things. It's light, light is coming. So, yeah, as far as I can tell, we were with Krishna or somebody or by Lord, Lord Narayan, and somehow or other we have free will. And so then we turned away. We turned towards the external energy and we become covered over. And so then, Nitya Siddha, Krishna Prema, Sadya Kabunaya, Shravanadi, Shude Chitte, Karadevudaya. Nitya Siddha, Krishna Prima. Love of God is an eternal perfection of the soul. And it's not something you get from some other source. When you engage in hearing and chanting, it naturally wakes up. And so that's what's happening as far as looking at it. It's, it's, we're there. We have our relationship. Bhukta Kumari goes back to the spiritual world. He has his family, everything else. They're waiting for him. Where have you been? You know, you know, okay, oh, you know, it's, you know, it's, wake, it's waking up. And you have a name, a form, a family, everything else. Okay. When we're doing this revival, so then natively, this revival takes place. And of course, it's not so much on traditions, it's more of just acknowledging that it's maintained. It's not so much the inquiry before, or another thought, like why it's happening, looking for explanations of something that's already established. And now it's, it's not being lost on the surface. So, so, Socrates said, I can't teach you anything. I can just, Socrates said, I cannot teach you, teach you anything. I can just help you remember. Yeah. One model of education is sit still while I am still. 
it's an empty box. But no, other engineers, you know, yeah, maybe you can acquire some techniques and stuff. It's like you can acquire a certain kind of clothes because you live a certain place. But those are superficial. You pick those up because you need them. You know? But the real thing is simply to wake the person up to wake up their inquiring abilities, wake up, you know, these qualities. That's what a big corporation wants too. You know, yeah, looking for people, you know, with these qualities. So it's, yeah, it's, when a certain point where for boy, when you come to Raghunuga Bhakti, it's not what you do, it's how you do it. You're doing the same thing as everybody else. I remember one time I was in Miami, and one Madhuji lady, taller the girl, was doing, they were doing the, um, the Gora Arctic, and I was so, so incredible. It was just like she was exuding this consciousness of not being the body. <laughs> it was just like, it was just like, she was there doing the Arctic. Wow, she was driving on it. And so, yeah, it was, at that level, you can begin to see that you know, it's how they're doing it, not what they're doing. The same thing as everybody else, but now that's okay, the external circumstances. But now it's not. The next thing is, like you're saying, you start to let, stimulate your, your mode of doing it. Yeah. 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 Yes. There. Yeah. Two minutes. <laughs> I was wondering how we can uh, be institutionalized ourselves without neglecting our. Yeah. How can we? Be institutionalized ourselves without neglecting our duty. Be institutionalized ourselves without neglecting our duty. Okay, the same way the gopis do it. <laughs> I said, and that's the highest example. Ar Arjuna is an example because he he followed the institutional process, you know, being a kshatriya and doing all this stuff. But now he did it for Krishna. You know, hearing about how oh, because he heard who Krishna is. Krishna is everybody's well wisher. You're going to have to kill your grandfather. You're going to have to kill your your <laughs> martial arts teacher. You're going to have to kill your little cousins. You're going to I'm sorry, nephews, you know, yeah. But I, I'm everybody's friend, Bhagavad Gita, right? I love everybody so much. And so whatever is happening here, I'm going to use you in such a way. Bhishma and Jonah, they want to leave their bodies. They want to get a new body, you know, and your cousins. and you know. So then by hearing about who Krishna was, and it's okay, yeah, okay. And you direct me, I'll fight. Because I can see that, you know, it's, it's, it's your... You're guiding in a nice way. You know, you know how to use this knife in good fashion. I'll cut. Just tell me where to cut. So we're hearing about Krishna. We're hearing stories about, you know, lay, lay dharma for ladies, dharma for gentlemen, dharmas for, you know, shatri. You know, yeah. And we start all these stories, right? Then we start to see, okay, the, 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 they're institutional stories. The Bhagavatam is Daivivarnasham. It's full of stories about people in different circumstances like that. You know? And as you start to take them to heart, finally, every single circumstance you can see and you can see how it applies to you. So the gopis were good citizens. They're actually they're milking their cows and they're arguing over the price of yogurt. You don't want to argue with the gopis over the price of yogurt. <laughs> you know, they're like super, super businesswomen. Adoni ki Adoni is a really good business lady. Yeah. So that, but simultaneously within that institutional thing, they had their friends, second level. So, so what, what's, you know, if you belong to ISKCON and you're doing all the institutional stuff, you know, but you don't have any friends, you know, no, you're just natural. And then the friendship may be quite different than your institutional situation. You know, the pot worship may be the closest friend of the, the principal president, you know, and stuff. Because this is the way it is. Their friendship. You know, it's a different kind of thing than, than the institutional positions. And finally, the last level was that they all had a personal relationship with, with, with Krishna. They would hear the sound of his flute and this and that and everything else through so many media. So, so through so many media, we have to have a personal relationship with Prabhupada. If Prabhupada knows you, you know Prabhupada. Nothing. You know, I'm a new, I'm a new person. <laughs> Prabhupada, yeah, I know I'm watching you. Thank you. <laughs> he actually knows I'm here. Look at him. Yeah, I know you're here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, personal. Oh, yeah. Prabhupada says that the highest material trap is Varna Ashram Dharma. You can be a funny sannyasi. <laughs> you can be a chaste lady. You can be a very heroic Ramachari Sankar dog. Right? <laughs> okay, this is all roles. It's all institutions. It's all a part of the Virat Rupa. It's a part of the material world. You got it. You're using it. Prabhupada says this is the highest material trap. And he says, you only can surpass, surpass this when you make friendship with the, the devotee. Friendship with the devotee. So when you actually feel, you know, that you, you, you've earned the right to, 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 for Prabhupada to be your friend. You've done it, stuff like that, and you've controlled it. And then at that point, 
Yeah. But then it's a personal relationship. I mean, so many people have dreams of Prabhupada, and those dreams sometimes you realize this is, you know, yeah, different different level of existence. Yeah, Prabhupada's there, you can, yeah. In books he's there, but also in dreams and sometimes in English. Yeah, yeah. And then you realize, wow, some people were Prabhupada's secretary and you were getting this association, you know, constantly and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So that's it. You realize this is not, this is not a person acting out their role. And this is a real person. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's not eight o'clock. We will stop here because we are German. <laughs> and tomorrow we will hear something else. And now we will enjoy it for a second. We will enjoy it. I don't want to. Thank you all very much. All right, Krishna. Okay. Hope you're, uh, Hope you're bird in your cage. I want to thank our online audience. There's 18 people online. From Argentina, Chile, Peru, India, Spain. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you all very much for your association. Boise, Idaho.